Thank you for getting up so early on a Friday and investing time with me. Boy, this better be good. No pressure. Um, <laughs> introducing um, myself, uh, being intentional by way of connection to you all. My name is Lawrence Alexander. I'm a first generation um, college student talking about connecting the dots. My dad um, was a mailman in Jersey City, New Jersey, not the male men who get the behind the wheel and kind of drive and deliver, but my dad had the the push cart and uh, the belt with the big buckle that said U.S. Postal Service, which, because I'm 40, back in those days when you can spank children, it's recording, don't tell anybody, um, the fear was always getting that U.S. mail buckle on your butt. Um, but that, that was my dad and my mom was a nurse. She was an LPN, a licensed practicing nurse, and worked three days a week with 12-hour shifts. And so they literally uh, mortgaged their future so that my sister and I could go to school. They, um, neither one of them, um, went beyond high school, my mom to, to nursing school, but really mortgaged a working class uh, lifestyle so that my sister and I could both go to college to have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. So I know that journey may resonate with some folks here. Um, I got my degree, actually, my master's in, in an area that I think is pretty helpful. Um, mine is on uh, my master's in counseling and higher education. And we actually looked at the K through college continuum, as it were. So even from a professionalized and educative background, this connectivity uh, from classroom to career, this uh, paradigm and swing from education to the workforce has actually been a really uh, prodigious part of my background. So grateful to be here with you all. As some of you may know, um, the kid from Northern New Jersey does have some pretty deep roots in New England. Uh, spent three years working in Bethlehem, New Hampshire at the White Mountain School. And over the last couple of years, as Yvonne has said, um, done work with a couple of the main districts, RSU 14 and RSU 21, and done some work in uh, South Portland, even drove all the way up to Bangor. Yes, all the way up to Bangor, because from the south coast of Massachusetts, where we live now, South Dartmouth, up to Bangor, and might as well have been Canada. Maine, I want you to know I am committed, because I've gotten behind the wheel and put in the miles. So um, deeply entrenched in the work and, and grateful to be with you all. If I were starting, I, I want to start with um, two stories that I think are, are helpful in laying context. I, I believe part of my conversation with you all is making the business case, uh, the economic, sustainable business case for racial equity and justice, which is not really an appeal that many people have made, but I, I want to make that. I want to wade in with two stories. The first one, I've not really told. Um, a lot of people, I think it otherwise would have gotten misunderstood. It's an experience that I had two summers ago now, in the summer of 2019, when um, moving from northern New Hampshire, Bethlehem, down here to the uh, south coast of Massachusetts in a little enclave above Cape Cod um, called South Dartmouth, uh, particularly paid Narum. I remember I couldn't even pronounce it when I got here. And so it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting experience. I haven't shared it much. Um, but I just feel so close to you virtually, you know what I mean? So I'll share it with you. Ready? Um, the experience was I, for the first time in my life, had white movers, white movers. It was a white moving company from Littleton, New Hampshire, who drove me and my very black family, all of us, my wife and our six kids, that's eight of us, drove us and our stuff from Northern New Hampshire down into the South Coast of Massachusetts. I didn't even know white people were movers. They were movers. Because when I grew up, the moving companies were black people and Filipino folks and Hispanic folks. And when I worked and lived on the east end of Long Island, we had day laborers out in front of the 7-Eleven and the Home Depot, they were Mexican. I didn't know that white people worked for moving companies. It was amazing. And I not only had one, I had three. And boy, did we have a lot of stuff because I told you we have a lot of kids. We had white, movers, which is amazing because you know New Hampshire, 87% forested, 96% white. Here I was with my black self. I had these white movers and we moved to an equally white neighborhood in South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Oh my God, you should have seen my neighbors doing probability and math. It was amazing. 
there were three white men who were moving and me, because I'm not lazy. My dad's a mailman and my mom was a nurse. I know how to work. So I rolled up my sleeves and I was out on the lawn moving my stuff in, but I watched my neighbors play the probability. There were four of us, three of us were white, one of us was black. There was a 75% math teachers, 75% chance that one of us was gonna look just like them. Oh, but there was a 25% chance that their new neighbor was gonna be very, very different. I was so excited, I couldn't wait. The movers left. I couldn't wait. We didn't even have a forwarding address. I got up the next morning and checked the mail, which was really petty because I didn't get any mail, but I wanted them to know that I lived here. And I went outside in my Minions pajama bottoms because I also wanted to know I slept here. And it said one in a million. And I remember standing on my lawn in my one in a million um, PJ bottoms, looking at my white neighbors on their lawn. And I looked at them and they looked at me and they knew one thing was true, friends. The neighborhood had changed because this wasn't section eight. I can afford to be here and I bought this house. If you hit what I'm pitching, because I respect educators and I wanna hit the hi-hat early, the business case for racial equity and justice, good friends on the island, good friends in Maine, the neighborhood is changing. Are we preparing today for tomorrow? One story, I told you two. I'm keeping count this early in the morning. By the way, as you can tell, I am a morning person. Wicked sweet. So second story, friend of mine, he's Guyanese. Uh, he's a lawyer and um, he's first generation American Guyanese. And he uh, he lives in Baltimore, a uh, city out, uh, enclave outside of Baltimore, uh, Maryland. It's uh, called Roland Park for folks who are, who are kind of familiar. And when his parents came and they were working class Guyanese folks, they bought their first family house very proud. And when he was eight, he can remember his dad calling him into the room to see the deed on the house. They had gone up to the attic somehow and were kind of digging through the archives and he found the deed to the house. This had to have been, cause he's uh, roughly in his sixties now. So maybe, maybe back in the, the 60s, 70s then. And the deed to his house, roughly the 60s, 70s to his house in Baltimore, Maryland, Guyanese family said two things about who you can't sell to. Said no N words and no Jews. They bought the house anyway. And that was the best part. Flash forward this summer, he buys his uh, dream house for his family. They've, they've, they've had some um, really nice rental properties, but now they, they've bought, he's got his, um, his dream house. Guyanese man, um, really well to do. He's a lawyer and he buys his own home and has his own son and remembers the lesson he learned as a boy and pulled up the deed again, 2021. Wouldn't you know, original deed to the house, said the same thing. No N-words, no Jews. Interestingly enough, if you know me by now, I was so inspired. I wanted to know if they had other homes in the area. I wanted to buy like five of them and fill them all with black people. That'll show them the neighborhood is changing. Are we? Now, you know, Mainers, that I, I weighed in with love because I know you. There, you know, people perseverate in all this controversy about like DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and CRT, critical race theory. They don't know Maine. Screw those three letters. The most um, impenetrable third rail three letters in the country, and Mainers know it, are P, F, A. You know it. Don't make those faces, I can see your faces. People from away. I'm simply trying to get us to work to some candor about the fact that racially, ethnically, socioeconomically, educationally, and from an employment perspective, the neighborhood has changed. Are we holding on to the island? to the state of Maine, to our schools, to our communities as they were, or are we preparing for them as they will be? We tried, I mean, we tried in, in, in the last 18 months to make the emotional um, guilt riddled, don't you feel bad about racism plea? It, it, it didn't work. I mean, it worked for a little bit, I guess, right? Like you tend to marches, 
with your Uggs and you, have, you hold your lattes and you make posters and then you leave, like the guilt wears off. Um, you read books, you hold book clubs, you invest money for consultants. And, and boy, have we go back to school this year? That's worn off. I think it's a bad approach. I could care less about tugging on heartstrings and making me feel guilted and making people feel bad. Think about your neighborhood. Think about your homes. Think about the community you live. If you love Maine so much, and I know that you do, if you love the island so much, and I know that you do, wouldn't we be wise to prepare for our community as it will be? I think the answer is so. I have some slides to share on the deck. I want to invite great conversation, but I wanted you all to know that I was prepared, excited to be with you all. Now, um, I do, and I'm excited to, in this virtual environment, make the exchange of, of ideas, questions. Please feel free to ask questions, make comments, push back. We're, I'm good with that. Um, while I share, please, if you want to um, call those thoughts as you go along, put them in the chat, and uh, Yvonne and Crystal will, will call those, and I'm happy to, to um, have those come back to me. Otherwise, I'll prepare to go for the next, I don't know, call it 30, 40 minutes or so, and I really do. Um, I do mean it. I know we'll have the time in, um, in the session after, but if there's any uh, exchange or anything you want to know now, please feel free to do that. Grateful to be spending this morning with you all. Really want to talk about us making the business case for racial equity and inclusion. Um, for me, it's about connecting the dots. Uh, you heard me re refer to my graduate program um, earlier, and I did that on purpose, really look at the connectivity between our educational institutions and our career pathways. You also heard me mention that I'm 40 years old. I also um, mentioned that for a reason. My generation, we're really old millennials holding on for dear life, which is why I have so many sneakers in my background. I should really grow up but not till I wear them all. Um, but our generation is the most uh, over-educated, um, underemployed, or at least not earning enough generation um, in, in history, right? We, we got a lot of degrees. It didn't necessarily connect to all of the jobs. And who told us about college loans? What in the entire world? As we move into another generation, um, and I'm raising six of those uh, young, brilliant people, we can ask ourselves with curiosity about what the educative, economic, socioeconomic future is going to be for our children. I can tell you what, they will be educated, but not overly in debt, hopefully. They will have options, that's for sure. And one of the innovations that's come from the pandemic, which is actually why all of us can be, though we have to be, on Zoom instead of in a conference place somewhere and not uh, fumbling over ourselves, is because we've discovered that we can do many things remotely. And the workforce, in part, has caught up. There are many, many, many employers with young people who have enough education who will never, never have to go to a brick and mortar office. I am still mind blown. I have, and my six kids are 19, 15, 10, 8, 3, and 18, 19 months. It, I am gobsmacked to think about the fact that they may never need a business card. What? No business cards, no office. Connecting the dots. How do we go from our kinder care to college to career and think about Maine's sustainable future? I think that's why I'm here. So the big ideas, the big ideas that I hope to socialize with you all in the time we're here is that our economic, not just financial, but our economic sustainable, how we do this when we're not here, and commodifiable future hinges on racial equity and inclusion. Full-throated truth. The, <laughs> the hypocrisy, if not my curiosity, around the resistance on racial equity and inclusion, or at least uh, the lowest possible bar to allow participation in the American economic flourishing um, of some, not all white people against some, not all black people in 2021, for me is almost hypocritical to the founding of the nation because if there's one thing our forefathers knew was that there was a deep connection between black bodies and our economic uh, boom. It seems like this return to Jim Crowism and to separatism of all things is bereft of that acknowledgement. Our country was founded and catapulted economically because we knew that there was an economic gain out of folks of color. All I'm suggesting 
is that as we are looking at the swing demography of our country, becoming more diverse racially and ethnically and socioeconomically, majority white states, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, there are many others that are not in New England, but you get the idea. It is in our benefit, it, an imperative, I think, to lean into racial equity and inclusion. And listen, by the way, you know, I hope people do it because it's the morally right thing to do, that you feel some care about the future. I also don't care if you care. I care if you like your house, your community, your neighborhood. If you just want to be in me in another 10 to 20, 30, 50 years, then racial equity and inclusion is our future. Secondly, and for me, it's so much, um, it's so much beyond. I think the conversation is so binary and limited, um, whether it's political or where people stand on race or understanding. This literally, this inclusive, recursive, ongoing, iterative process of asking ourselves if people who do not look like us can be in our community and can we participate, even if it's in allowing them to participate in human flourishing, would we resist that progress at our own peril? Now, update about South Dartmouth this is in this little community, uh, Peyton Aram that I'm in. I love it and they love me. Turns out they're not racist. They're classist, just like me. We both like our lawns taken care of. I can go with that. I've learned not to care about people's political leanings or the degree to which they care about my black life. I do care that people care about their class, their community, and their sustainable future. Will we, in a ubiquitous sense, if you take it out of this conversation in a specific sense, since you're the one in front of your computer, would we resist our own progress at our own peril? You know, listen, I don't believe for a moment, I'm thinking about the Montgomery bus boycott. <laughs> I don't remotely believe that they integrated the bus in Montgomery because they believed in uh, integration. They believed in getting riders back on the bus so they could refuel the economic system. Friends, I have grown agnostic to motivation for my own sanity. Would we resist our own future, our, our, our progress at our own peril? So this is the idea that I've been socializing with folks and I think is important to stop on the, the journey to at least help people answer the question about, you know, Lawrence, what's the goal, right? We're, we're in the state of Maine. We're a, a, a double down, if not triple down, we're on the island, right? Uh, what are you gonna get a helicopter and drop off uh, 30,000 uh, people of color and indigenous folks? Like, is that, like, is, is, what, what is the, what's the goal? And the short answer is no, right? An influx or infusion of people of color in any community alone does not equal racial equity and justice. To wit, you can have a profundity of people of color in a community still be inherently racist. I grew up in Northern New Jersey, trust me, I know. And do you see what's coming out of New York City? I've never seen a place so, so diverse and so very racist. Look at the things that are happening with independent schools in New York City. OMG, Maine, y'all are doing well. Burn the bridges, glad y'all are on the island. Um, so diversity alone is not the goal. Diversity is just a uh, fact. You can be incredibly racially and ethnically diverse and a community be racist. You can have a lot of women in a community and be incredibly sexist. You can have a lot of folks in the LGBTQIA community in a community and still be incredibly homophobic. Diversity alone is just the fact. So know that for me, folks, the, the goal is not nitpicking at your facts and figures. However, everything else is in our control. Equity is a choice. We can choose to see people uniquely as they are and meet them at the point of their need. So equity, um, I give you examples out of the um, school uh, context uh, arena in Maine, and then uh, maybe you all can think about those in the workforce. So I know from working with folks on some superintendent searches in Maine that there is a Maine uh, superintendent certificate that folks would need to have in order to be Maine um, supervisors. Well, follow the line of logic. If we were going to recruit people who are outside of the state of Maine, 
duh, they probably wouldn't come in with said certificate. Equality would say everybody's got to have the same thing. It would be tone deaf if you didn't think through the eyes of equity and say, and, and a lot of folks are, you can come in and basically have a provisional um, covering um, and we would make sure that you pursue that, um, that licensure and we would pay for it. Equity is about making a way for everyone to get there, not expecting everyone to get there the same way. You might think about that in terms of your workforce training programs or requirements, not thinking about those as a static you have to have, but equity says, how can we help many people get what they need? In school, and any of you, and I'm sensitive to, um, if, if, because uh, my son has an IE, one of my sons has an IEP, if any of you all have children or are educators with children with learning differences, you know firsthand that, e that equality is not fair, equity is. And those two students are the same, so every student uh, gets what they uniquely need. Beyond equity, right? So I make sure that you have what you need. Inclusion, and again, it's hard for us, uh, 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 us PFAers, uh, us folks from away, right? Uh, or, or believe um, in, you know, kind of uh, born and bred manners. Um, inclusion is not just tolerating someone here, it's an action. So what do I actually do to make people feel like they belong? Um, and then ultimately belonging, if, if there was an equation, it's kind of diversity plus inclusion, diversity plus equity plus inclusion, what sits on the other side of the equal sign is belonging. How does someone, and it's not political, it doesn't require you to have a PhD on racial justice, but how do we make every member of a community feel like they belong? Now, sit with this idea. My job right now, and I am, again, I'm an old fart relative to the uh, generational swing, but imagine that we are educating right now or our children are, our nieces and nephews are part of a generation who may never ever have to go to a brick and mortar office. Imagine that they can live anywhere and work everywhere. Look around your community, look out your window. Is your, the, is your community the type of community that many people from away would want to live? I live here in South Dartmouth. There's no reason for me to live here. I'm far from freaking Logan. I'm over an hour away. And I'm like 40 minutes from Providence and Providence is a regional airport. This area relative to my job sucks, but my wife likes it and I listen. Point is, there's no rhyme or reason for me to live where I live other than we chose it. You get the idea if you multiply by a couple of million folks and generations to come. If anyone can live in your community, the question is fair. Why should anyone? live in your community. And yet, right, and, and I'm cognizant that we're here trying to filter through the noise. And, and, and I, I, I would just wanna help people filter through the noise. These are some social media accounts. This is a, a school in um, New York City. Um, warm your hands by the dumpster fire. Um, it's an it's a Instagram page from a school in New York City that's just gaslighting DEI work in schools, not really what it is, but the way that they uh, straw, um, straw dog it and say that it is. And then on the right, it's just an article that was out of the Washington Post. And, and by the way, just know that I know as a matter of clarity, you know, this one talks about conservatives, et cetera. Know that I know in this moment, the people who resist racial equity work are on both sides of the aisle. You know, it, it, it's one thing to, um, put a Black Lives Matter sign or a pride sign in your lawn. It's another thing to let somebody next to you buy, uh, buy that, that house that just went on sale. Um, racism creeps into the, uh, the most liberal of us. And so know that I know that there is resistance to the depth of which that this will go. And for you all pursuant to this conversation, to our workforce, to our communities, to our backyards, to our neighboring towns, it's everywhere. To this, I would say, and I'll expound in a couple of more slides, for people who gaslight it, usually the methodology is um, folks are trying to indoctrinate us. I don't believe so. People are trying to make it political. I, I don't think so. What, what I am hoping to imbue to you all is a certain sense of acuity and focus that for me, and I think for us, to the extent that it's relevant, this is a business case. 
Yes, we want this work around racial equity and justice and inclusion to be good for our kids, good for our community. But for a moment, it's literally a business case. You take predominantly white states bereft of the economic industry or workforce industry necessary to draw many people nationally and Maine in this particular moment is one, it is to our peril to neglect this imperative. I don't believe we're asking anyone, I certainly didn't, about who you voted for in the last election and who you vote for in the next. I didn't ask you to put a pride flag or a Black Lives Matter flag in your lawn. I'm asking you if you want your lawn in 20 to 30 years from now. I don't think it's political and I don't think it's indoctrinating. I think it's a business case. So I offer this up um, and these are my babies. Um, thinking about there's so many, this is why I stay so busy. Um, but, but I want to offer you just some insight because I do know that we're talking to folks in the workforce, folks who are educators. This is, um, at least sample size, my experience, what I would be looking for in a community and at least some texture around what we're trying to communicate relative to racial equity and justice. And I figured I would just make it personal and share with my kids. So my daughter on the, uh, so I have two girls and four boys. I know it's like a small school. Um, on the right is my daughter, Jalen. I just saw her last week and I was down at Wake. Um, she's a sophomore um, down at Wake Forest. And as you all know, you know, Wake is a um, predominantly white school, about 6,000 undergrads. They do a really great job, honestly, around racial equity and justice. And um, their tuition is, ridiculous. Um, it's $77,000 a year. What in the bumper sticker? Um, she wants to go into broadcast journalism. And for the longest, we talked about um, how she would be in the booth or in the studio and how work would lead her there. And through the pandemic, that's totally changed because we watched ESPN pivot. We watched Fox pivot. We watched so many um, broadcast outlets pivot. My daughter is uh, 19, she'll be 20 in February. The odds are very likely of two things. Number one, because she's at a top 30 school like Wake Forest, that she'll likely walk right out, uh, across the graduation stage into a job. In her generation, she'll probably walk into a job closer um, to six figures than less. And her job, even in broadcast journalism, will likely be remote. She'll be able to live anywhere and work everywhere. Wouldn't we wanna give her, right? And this is her specifically been a ubiquitous sense. Wouldn't we wanna give her a reason to live in Maine? And by the way, for context, the reason I raised it, she was at a board, she was at the boarding school I was at in Northern New Hampshire too. Likes to do weird New England stuff, like ski and climb. I'm from New Jersey. I'm built for the ground, not for the sky, but she likes that kind of stuff, right? Some of us would, um, about racial equity and inclusion, we'd perseverate and say, no one would want to come and live in Maine or no one would come to, want to come and live on the island. It's just not true. We're here in the South Coast. I'm looking at water right out of my window. Um, my son, Elijah, is the one with the Positive Black Stereotypes book bag. He just turned 10. He's the best. And we're not Red Sox fans, which is weird. I don't, ugh, I'm from New Jersey, but they talk about indoctrination. They got my baby. And um, he's, he's a shortstop. He's the best player on his team. But as a young Black boy who's really athletic, he's not interested in sports. He plays the piano and he plays the guitar. He's actually a really talented musician. My daughter, going back to Jalen, um, she has a, a name I didn't know. And you all may know this um, in colleges uh, for black kids who don't play sports. She's a NARP, an N-A-R-P. A NARP is a non-athletic regular person, a non-athletic regular person. And many of us might have been NARPs. But what's interesting, and I tie the two together to make this point, Jalen is at a um, ACC school, Division I school. As a NARP, a non-athletic regular person, a Black girl, she's in the minority of the minority because the majority of Black kids at Wake are scholarship athletes. How do we hold space for kids of color who are just bright? Not our athletes, not tokenized on scholarship, not indentured because we're paying for them, could we give them reasons to be in a community? So I hold up my son, Elijah, thinking about the state of Maine. If you had a more fairly uh, socially upwardly mobile 
quasi affluent family with kids who have interest in the arts? Is there infrastructure to support them? Are there ways in which my daughter, uh, uh, Layton, is a gymnast, uh, the eight year old, and um, she's one of the only black girls in the gym. I think about when we're in Northern New Hampshire, there is, uh, and I know Northern New Hampshire is small, but I remember there were two pharmacies, uh, a CVS and a Walgreens. It was only the Walgreens that in the beauty section had hair products for black girls. Right, so number one, that sucked, but number two, they actually had it. Again, workforce, workplace, when you think about goods and services that would even be for people of color, would we even have the infrastructure if they came? I offer my family in part, and I could go down the rabbit hole to think about our level of preparation. Are we just serving who we have now, or could we be preparing a workforce in our communities for who would be to come? Um, what I wanted to do was to try to get the real field temperature on what I think, because I want to help you all, because I, I know in part, because you all have signed up and you're here and you're leaning in, this is a bit of preaching to the choir about making the case for racial equity and justice and I know that if you preach the choir, they'll sing louder. So I'm hoping that when you sing these songs after the service, um, no, but you get the idea. So here, if I were being visceral, um, this is in schools. This is in the workplace. For people who say that we shouldn't talk about race, and listen, I'm not tone deaf. I know there's some vociferous voices in the state of Maine because they're vociferous in the state of Massachusetts, a very, very faux progressive, faux liberal community we are here. Um, <laughs> they vote that way, but they don't act that way. Um, so this is what I think people are saying. So this is just an identity wheel and y'all have seen a million of these. You put them, or you think about your own identity, age, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, sexual orientation. When you get to the totality of it, in part, it encompasses all of who we are. You know, So for me, uh, I'm African-American, cisgender Christian male who played varsity sports and went to private school, whatever. It makes up the sum total of who we are. Every day that we put on shoe or Ugg or flannel shirt, no, that's New Hampshire. Um, you get the idea, we, we bring our full selves. We should, we should, should be able to bring our full selves to work and to school. If I can't bring my full authentic self, and yes, I show up like this every day. Oh my God, would you hire me? You probably would not. This is so much. Um, if I can't bring my full self and if my kids, if I discover that my kids can't, I'm not sending my kids to school. And so this is an activity I actually did. And I'm wading into an activity I did with kindergarten kids and kindergarten kids understood this. So I think that we can too. This is an iceberg identity activity. And folks in the classroom have seen something like this. The idea being with an iceberg that 10% of who you are is above the surface, 90% is below. And they filled in kind of dimensions of their identity. And we went on to do the following activity. So I had these kids. Um, we were talking about our multicultural selves. Um, put five of their interests. These were kindergarten kids. And this was an all boys school. So they understood identity a little bit, but they understood passions and interests a lot. So in these five circles, they would write things like Mima, because they love their grandma, or time with families or holidays. And then it was like a lot of Roblox and PJ Masks and Chicken Squad. Y'all don't watch cartoons. I do, Teen Titans. It was amazing. So we put these five, you know, they bubbled these five things in. And then, and I didn't think for five-year-old boys, it would be so emotional. It was torturous and hilarious at the same time. I said, listen, pick one of those circles. Cross it out. Imagine coming to school and not being able to share that identity, passion, or interest with your classmates. Oh my God, I never knew it would get so weepy with little boys. I felt bad, but it was a good learning opportunity. And if I didn't torture those kids, I wouldn't have the lesson to teach to you all. So thank you, fifth grade, uh, five-year-old boys. No, hyperbole. You get the idea is that even at that age, they understood that even if it was something that might have been as pedantic to us as a cartoon or time with their Mima, it was significant to them. And if they couldn't bring their full selves to school, boy, would it be hard to school. Friends, I say all that to say this. I think the perseverating and gaslighting around conversations around racial equity and justice, or certainly, imagine it, actually doing the work of racial equity and justice to not do it to neglect it is to 
ask someone not to bring their whole self to work and to bring their whole self to school. From a human perspective, I'm asking you to think about this, at least through the eyes of one person and one parent, and I go back a couple of slides, why in the world would I invest life in limb through a generation of a father who's a mailman, a mom who's a nurse? I think I did okay. I have six kids of my own. Why in the world would I subject any one of my children, and any of yours, by the way, too, to a place or a community where they couldn't be their whole selves? I mean, the I, I want you to see the ordain. <laughs> of resistance that would expect not in 2021 in 2025 2030 2045 for a highly educated highly prepared highly diverse educational community and workforce to put up with work you haven't done now resistance We'll be at our peril. So we have tools. Yes, we do, friends. Um, what we want to do, and, and this is really on monoculturalism, and I want you to think about your uh, school community and also your workforce community. This um, distillation comes to us from Dr. Valerie Batts. She is the, uh, a Black woman. Um, her, hun John, her husband, Dr. John Capitman, is a Jewish man, and they started a DI organization in Dorchester, Massachusetts. I say Dorchester because I'm from New Jersey. If you're from the Boston area, then you'll be really annoying because you say something like Dorchester. And oh my God, don't say Dorchester, but it's Dorchester. Started a DI organization called Visions. And from it, this is a really cool image and I think helpful. Um, and don't worry, I've already shared this with Yvonne, so you all have this later, about the paradigmatic shift from monoculture to, plur uh, to pluralism in a community. So yeah, I love y'all, you know, in the state of Maine. So I pick on this PFA thing, but remember, my parents are originally from Georgia, Southwest Georgia, Tifton, Georgia. So we know something about monoculture. Um, I always pick and tell people that my, I always pick with people and tell my, my parents are from Maine, the main part of Georgia. And so monoculturalism, as it were, is this idea, and we've all said it, or at least heard it, about diversity in America as the melting pot. You see that at the bottom left. And, um, you know, oh man, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from. When you come to America, it's the melting pot, melting pot. You know, what could be wrong, right, with saying the melting pot? Ah, oh, I get it. It's the melt into the pot. The idea that in order to be in a community, that we have to conform in order to norm, which means being less like ourselves and more like other people. Well, if you hit what I'm pitching in a predominantly white community, uh, workforce, environment, state, the not so hidden message is that you have to code switch um, and that you have to be less like yourself and more like other people. Monoculture and this melting pot is not appealing to people who have options. You know, one of the reasons we've been able to get away, and this is an American populace writ large, and then I would say white culture is somewhere underneath that, we've been able to get away with saying we're all the same or speak American. By the way, could anything sound more ignorant? Oh my God, speak American. I think you mean speak English, but we still say it anyway. Um, we've been able to say that because we've had such a dominant presence and there's been people of color and from historically excluded backgrounds who are bereft of options. You're not talking to those same people anymore. A more educated, a more talented workforce, people have options. So there's this idea of monoculture, and I'll be specific with Maine, is gonna really, and, and, and the island, uh, maybe even more specifically, you're gonna have to really wrestle with what it means um, to value your community and to what extent everyone needs to be like everyone for everyone to like everyone. Because the shift, in that orange hour about recognizing our differences, understanding them, appreciating them, and then oh, look, utility, using those differences. Didn't say you have to like it. I said, you have to find the utility in me. Remember, it's a business case. We could lean into this pluralistic multicultural society. Um, and what I like, what I like is at the bottom, instead of like that melting pot, it's this idea of a salad bowl. 
the salad bowl is that like cherry tomatoes are not lettuce and lettuce is not kale uh, unless lettuce is kale i don't know i don't eat vegetables you can tell no um or like a fruit salad right that pineapples are not watermelons are not grapes you get the idea that you uh, unity doesn't have to be unanimity right we don't have to all be uniform in order to form a community with unity uh to what extent can we lean into this idea and 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 honestly right it's going to lead to a future where mainers air quotes or um folks on the island look very different than they do now uh, my three-year-old he'll be four um next month on the third matthew is a Grafton County native. He was born in Littleton, New Hampshire. It's going to be, I can't wait. I mean, it's going to be a hell of a bar conversation when he gets old enough, maybe he goes to the bar. And he's like, guess where I was born? Black kid born in New Hampshire, but he actually was. And he's only lived in New England all his life. He's born in New Hampshire. We moved to, um, to Massachusetts. My son, Asher, a little pandemic baby, he's 19 years old. He was born at Providence William, uh, Women's and Children. He was born in Rhode Island, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. You get the idea that this phenomena about people from away being your neighbors, born in your communities, in your hospitals, educated in your schools, and working next to you, starting businesses, and getting white movers to move them next to you is a thing we have to embrace because, friends, the neighborhood has changed. If I were offering conversation, and I hope they help to give you all the dialogical tools um, along the way. I'm not just being silly. I want to be intentional with where I want to get you all to is that I think the conversation and this is more so in school, but this can be a community. Um, I'm a performative introvert, so I do spend a lot of time talking to myself. So on the left side of this is kind of what monoculture in schools, which you can also say in the community would say. And some people might right? even here trying to lean in and learn. I don't see color. Yes, you do. Yes, yes, you do. How would you stop at a red light, slow down at a yellow light, or go at a green light? You see color. But more than that, racially and ethnically, we do see color. And, and what people mean, I believe, and I believe the best in them, when they say they don't see color, it means that they don't discriminate um, against people based on their color, race, or ethnicity. And boy, do we appreciate that. People of color have been discriminated against. What it limits is your capacity to believe that I have a very human experience in this racialized identity. I don't need you to change it. I don't need you to fix it. I need you to believe it. I need you to believe that my beautiful daughter, Layton, who's eight, has gone to school and little girls in Northern New Hampshire told her that her skin looks like mud. I need you to believe that my daughter goes to the gymnastics studio and girls ask to touch her hair. I need you to believe that my children shock people when they're both athletic and not interested in being athletes. I don't need you to change it. I need you to believe it. So I need you to see color and see me being a human being, having a different user experience because of the skin that I was born in. But then monoculture will say things like, well, we don't talk about race in school or we don't talk about race at work. Uh, shocker friends, uh, whether or not you talk about race, uh, I'm gonna be black in school, at work, I'm going to be having a very, very, very racial experience, especially if I were to live in Maine. So isn't it convenient that you don't have to talk about race? But I live it. We would also say in the career and in curricular space that conversations about race have nothing to do with our curriculum. Oh, yeah. Then how did all the white guys get to be authors and protagonists and publishers and editors? There weren't any women smart enough. Weren't any men, um, uh, people of color smart enough. Race is clearly part of our curriculum. What you mean is that diversity of race and ethnicity and of sex and gender and sexual orientation is not. Again, when we say the students should have those, or even in the workforce, we should have those conversations outside of school for people who are living in these bodies you're telling me that there's a part of me that's unwelcome. In fact, you're telling me that the industrial part of me, the part that does your job and spins your widgets and turns your gadgets, that's the part you want. But the part that is uniquely me is not desired. Boy, does that sound more like um, the founding of our country than the flourishing of our country. And then that conversations are anti-white about uh, race and that 
conversations are divisive. Now, don't get me wrong. I have. I absolutely have and will agree. I have some colleagues who have been, um, and by colleagues, I mean people that I really don't know, like Ibrahim Kendi and Robin D'Angelo. I don't know these people. Please don't think that we all know each other. We do not. Um, but they have been, you know, there have been some folks who have been awfully irresponsible and gaslighting and divisive. I, I, I understand that, right? Every good message can have a bad messenger. And what I hope is that responsible conversations about race and difference can certainly be dividing. I'm going to land the plane in a couple of moments. So please feel free to socialize any questions or thoughts in the chat. Just teeing you all up because I know that an hour goes fast and I like y'all. What I think we can get to if we shift the paradigm to multiculturalism in schools is or, or in the workforce. The reason that we talk about race um, is because we see each student, each community member, each employee as fully human. I want you to bring your full self here because the fullness of who you are is the completeness of our community. Bring your full self. And because of that, you bring who you are with you. We want all of you, not some of you, or, or the commodifiable parts of you. Race matters. Race is an instructive uh, dimension of identity that has historical implications. Remember, I don't waste a drop of your time. I told you about my colleague's experiences with the deeds to his house. Whether or not you want to talk about race, race clearly is an instructive dimension, not only of history and textbooks, but apparently of redlining, redistricting, home owning, mortgaging, and where people can actually live. You don't have to believe in systemic racism for it to be true. It's just like not believing in gravity. You don't believe in gravity, go and jump out the second floor of your window because then that way you won't hurt yourself. Gravity is real, whether or not you want to believe it. Students bring their full selves to our schools. Educators, employees bring their full selves. We have to care for the whole person. Also in the conversation, and, and this is what I often get is, well, do we have to talk about race because Maine is so white? That's exactly the reason you need to talk about race. Remember the kids that you're raising. If we're doing this right. And I'm just talking about white kids for a moment. If we do this right, the number one value on becoming a more diverse community and developing more culturally, culturally competent students is not, is not what we do, white people, because we're guilty and we would help poor people of color. It's what white people actually do for white people. Remember, I spent 10 years working as a college counselor in predominantly white schools. I was often the first black man that white kids had as someone who was consequential in their lives. They might have had other people who delivered their mail, clipped their hedges, or were domestic that were people of color. But a consequential adult that was a person of color is instructive to their thoughts about who people in positions of leadership can be. Because while it may not be an explicit lesson, implicitly they're learning it and it makes a huge decision, it makes a huge difference in their lives. I've long left schools, retired and live in my basement. My little most long lasting uh, relationships are not, believe it or not, with kids of color at my schools. They're with white kids. My kids of color, I love them and they know me just fine, but they've seen people who look like me before. So we do this for our own kids. And I'll go to um, some of the characteristics of 21st century skills and habits of global citizenry. If we want, just like, just focus on white kids. If we want them to be more educated, access higher education, access more post-secondary institutions, cultural competence, global citizenry, 21st century skills and habits, all elemental to leadership in the workforce is paramount. So what I would ask you all, and there, this is some of the Socratic seminar for you all to be reflecting on a time after here. I didn't can and present this presentation, so I don't want you all to let this go in one ear and out the other. I do want you to look out your windows. I want you to look around your school communities, around your, uh, work, your work communities. And every day with an equity lens, I would be asking these questions. Who feels like they're at home here? Who feels like they're just visiting? And who feels like they're just being tolerated? Almost worse than being hated and vilified and chased out of town. Feeling like I'm just being tolerated is a worse fate. Now, for our people who feel like they're at home, we love them. Hey, you're going to be here, right? We're not, we're not, we're not throwing out the mainers with the bathwater. Uh, you get what you get what I mean there. But we are asking ourselves with an intention on equity. Wait a minute, who does feel like they're being tolerated? How can we make them feel closer to feeling like they're at home? And who are the folks who feel like they're just passing by? Because if we don't tend to two and three. That is how we're losing out. 
on our potential value proposition in our community. Now, uh, unless you think I'm, you know, pitching y'all woo and making stuff up, which boy I could be, which is why I want you to do this work for yourselves, right? You got to, you got to chew your own meat. And if you're a uh, vegan or vegetarian, uh, not that, um, when you look at all of the characteristics on uh, 21st century uh, skills and habits, educators know this, and I, and, and I know that you all may, but I want it to be um, explicit so that you all have it. Whoa, number two, equity, diversity, and inclusion, one of the key components of 21st century education. And, and, and what we mean to unpack that is that our students ought to be able to see a diverse array of authors, protagonists, major contributors, not just in the humanities, but also in STEM. STEM folks, we are not letting y'all off the hook. As a referendum, and I share it a lot um, in math, if you look at Tufts University and Medford, Medford and Somerville, depending on which side of the T you get off of, in Massachusetts, uh, Moon Duchin is a professor there. There's a bunch of DEI electives in the math department. Uh, her lead elective, which is the name of a consultancy she has. It's called ding, uh, Geometry and Gerrymandering. Geometry and Gerrymandering, which I think is amazing, right? So here you have a math mind taking on these social, uh, socially relevant issues. So 21st century skills and habits are saying that we are, that diversity, equity, inclusion is certainly part of it and community relationships and then global citizenry, right? If we believe, forget believing in racial equity and justice, forget believing in how you feel about historically marginalized folks. If you just believe in education, in your workforce, in the best possible educated, talented um, uh, teams you can have, then these are part of it. And part of these uh, characteristics are issues related to racial equity, justice, and cultural competence. Lastly, I would have you all socialize your why in the state of Maine and on the island um, specifically. And again, don't worry. I know it would make me feel like, oh my God, you're taking copious notes because you're writing everything down. But I did share with Yvonne. So relax, friends. I thought about you all on a Friday morning. Um, but if I were being pragmatic, right? Because um, we can take this time and build it around um, maybe some of my uh, hubris, humor, or cult of personality. But long after you long out of Zoom, Long after this is over, I really do want you to socialize your why in the state of Maine. And by socialize, I mean share it with a friend who shares it with a friend who shares it with a friend. We're not indoctrinating. We're, 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 we're sharing the curiosity. And to me, these are the questions. In Maine, what is the value proposition of my K-12 education? If my K-12 education, and by the way, I'm not at all, I'm not at all leaning toward a single story of every student in college. I am saying that every K-12 institution should set a student up for post-secondary success that directly connects to your workforce where your workforce operate, uh, operates optimally. And when it does, it is diverse, it is culturally competent and is prepared for commerce and engagement outside of the state of Maine and certainly off the island. But what's the value proposition of your K-12 education? Secondly, how successful is your post-secondary planning and placement? Are students just left to figure it out on their own? I can tell you, and this is um, public schools. I love y'all, but here it comes. Um, as it relates to college counseling and college guidance, and I don't mean this about any of the staff at Angle School. I love my colleagues. I'm talking about in terms of state funding for college counseling, and this is public schools writ large. We suck. The only reason I was ever able to work as a college counselor in a public school is because I worked at a network of all girls schools that was funded by a foundation and they paid for my role. There was no way in the world that a public school, most, some do by some stroke of goodness, pay for a dedicated college counselor or a guidance counselor, post-secondary planner. Most times, God bless them, these guidance counselors and school counselors are doing 82 million jobs. And the job that is most consequential around post-secondary planning and placement is the job they have the least time for and least training and preparation for. We, public schools, suck at this. So I'll start there and then you can figure out what's true in the state of Maine, but it, it does suck nationally. Um, how are students in Maine succeeding in college? And, and, and double down there, how are they succeeding in college and where are they coming back to after they graduate? So how effective are post-secondary institutions? And again, not a single story of college. So your career in technical education, your community colleges, your um, 
your trades uh, and apprenticeship kind of preparing communities? How connected are they pragmatically, right? Not philosophically to the workforce in the state of Maine. And then, uh, and this is really what I would want you all to think about. You know, I shared it personally, so it wasn't ubiquitous with my children, but you can look at this. And by the way, this can be, you know, kids from all types of backgrounds, but just our infrastructure, fitness, or at least heart attitude. What reason, what reason do college graduates have to remain in Maine? I know it kind of rhymed. I thought it was a pithy way to end, but I'll tell you what, it was a Facebook poll and Facebook, uh, Facebook is official if it's on Facebook. No, uh, I saw it about eight years ago. So I'm from the state of New Jersey. It did, and it was interesting uh, for you all to think about. Um, the state of New Jersey in this Facebook poll was the number one state in the country for people who were born there to leave. Damn it, guilty as charged, because boy, did I leave and I'm not going back. What is Maine's future? Are we nourishing and nurturing and cultivating the type of community from kindergarten to college to career that will remain in Maine? And can we be receptive to people from away? Because as I started, friends, the neighborhood has changed. The question is, have we? This is my email, because um, I know that, and I'm just teeing up Yvonne and others for any questions folks might have put into the chat, but that is my email address. That is my um, Instagram, if, if folks are, are so inclined. Uh, the deck, again, is shared with Yvonne, so I, I'm certain that after this, and I know we'll have directions about the follow-up session at about 1015, but if there are follow-up emails or questions, please do so if, if it's easier to do that. Um, if you want to tag and follow on social media, that's super helpful. And if there are any questions or comments or thoughts that folks wanted to socialize now, um, Yvonne, I'll pull down my deck that we can do that, but not before. I thank you, my colleagues, for your time, talent, and treasure. I know that time is precious real estate, and I hope to have used yours well this morning. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Uh, wow. I always, I do take copious notes. Anybody who's ever worked with me knows that. And so I have reams of notes from Cultural Competency Institute and several pages from today, um, but just, just really appreciate your perspective. I think we do have time for just a couple of questions that, that came up in the chat. <clears throat> and then again, um, can keep the conversation going in the next session. But um, one of the questions is, um, let's see. What would you suggest as two first steps for an overwhelmingly white workforce development system to do the work of inclusion that isn't just another group of white workforce development people talking about being more inclusive or maybe what not to do? So like a couple of just really practical first steps. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Uh, practical answers. I would um, look at your hiring practices um, and, and I'll be specific. Um, the, 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 the exclusion is not always uh, seldom. The exclusion is seldomly racist. It is sometimes because we, um, we're such a people business. Um, who are the last couple of people you hired? Well, I knew someone who knew someone who knew someone, so I hired them, and we, we continually are monolithic. And because we, um, and maybe it's a small business or a local business, um, we kind of um, don't take time to uncouple the competencies we need for a, a role versus people we know. And so sometimes in terms of starting, we could literally just do an audit of our job descriptions and see what we want and see how we can diversify our outreach for many candidates. Because you're right, just putting our heads together and kind of having a white think tank. And by the way, that's good and helpful because it's gonna be a healthy environment to bring folks into, but I would start to literally look at your hiring practice. And I've, I've worked, I work in retained search with a lot of folks doing that. So I, I would look at that. The other part I would look at too, is I would look at um, do, where are you posting for jobs? Uh, because that is, it could be a non-starter itself. There are some folks who are like, well, I put it in the local newspaper. Not the place to get the most diverse folks, right? Or your job boards, et cetera. So, you know, if there was a practical area categorically, I would look at hiring. How are we posting? Where are we posting? 
and how are we looking at competencies, that alone could give us a broader reach, which could bring us all kinds of other diversity. And don't throw away that group of folks getting together because that's going to help you be more healthy when people get there. Great. Thank you so much. We do have a few other questions, but we also are at time. So what I'd like to do is invite the people who asked the questions to come to the next session if that works for you. And if not, I can um, I can talk with Lawrence outside of this time and um, and get some answers for questions and either respond directly to people or post them in the notes from this um, this session that will be available to everybody. So this isn't the only chance to get those questions answered, but I do want to honor the time um, and just and just thank you again um, so much for your for your comments and I, I, I just want to it's particularly knowledge I love how personal you make it how relatable it is um, it's great seeing pictures of your kids I know it, one of the zooms for cultural company institute we got to meet the baby um, yeah. so it just it just really helps with that sort of humanizing full 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 your, your fullness um, bringing that to us so so thank you.